Okay. If you live in Duluth, if, if, if you live anywhere in Minnesota, you know what that sound means, right? Severe weather, a funnel cloud, maybe even a tornado touchdown somewhere nearby. But when I was growing up in Duluth, that's not what that sound meant at all. <laughs> it was the signal of potential impending doom. It, it was part of a nationwide civil defense system. We called them air raid sirens when I was a kid. And when you heard them wailing mournfully throughout town, you would immediately try to qualm a little knot forming in your stomach by asking yourself, is this the first Wednesday of the month by any chance? What time is it? Please, <laughs> please let it be 1 p.m. Because if it was, and thank God it always was, just a test. But most people have no idea how close we came to the real thing. And, and we all knew Duluth sat at the very tip of uh, America's northern nuclear spear, pointed straight at the Arctic and Russia beyond. So we all assumed, and probably correctly so, that the Red Menace had a nuke with our name on it, pointed right between our collective Duluthian eyes. These were terrifying times to grow up in Duluth. And little did we know that the likes of the Cuban Missile Crisis weren't the only times we flirted with Armageddon. No. No, it turns out a strange and totally unlikely chain of events would begin one dark night just a few miles from downtown Duluth. Ground Zero, and that incident, right off the Miller Trunk Highway, brought Duluth itself within minutes of starting World War III. Let me tell you about my hometown, greatest in the Gopher State. I'll have to brag a little bit, but I really won't exaggerate. Big D U L U T H, Duluth, Duluth. Oh, that's my hometown, Duluth, Duluth. Oh, that's my hometown. My story begins in the shallow, warm, summer waters of Pike Lake. You know uh, Pike Lake? <laughs> when I was a kid, that was my happy place. Club Med for toddlers. Uh, right up the Miller Trunk Highway. It was an auto club destination at the time. Uh, places that AAA uh, promoted so you could drive to them. I thought it was very cool that uh, Mom had to hold out her AAA card uh, through the open window of the family Ford in order to get in. Uh, the attendant would squint at that membership card before he'd even think of opening the gate. So exclusive. Pike Lake had a clubhouse. This wooden floored open space full of screaming kids testing the patience of any adults who may venture to attend. They had pinball machines and one of those indoor shuffleboard type games where you slid a metal puck down this um, miniature bowling alley. It had sawdust or something sprinkled on it to make it extra slippery and 
I don't know, kind of added to the aroma of the room as well. Uh, when you bought uh, your bottle of cream soda at the clubhouse, they gave you a little cardboard coupon, which you guarded with your life, because when you turned in your empty bottle and presented that coupon, they gave you back the five cent deposit. They had these picnic areas with uh, little screened-in cabins where you could eat your hot dogs and Cracker Jacks. They were spread out along a, a network of paths going through the woods near the lake. Those grounds were dotted with ominous-looking swampy bogs. Mom said they were quicksand. Oh my God, quicksand. Looking back, I'm thinking, she just said that, so we'd stay on the paths, wouldn't get our feet all muddy. But with uh, Tarzan movies uh, and such as my only reference, <laughs> man, terrifying. As a kid, I always imagined quicksand was, was going to be a much more uh, monumental challenge to survival, you know, than, than it actually turns out to be. But it made an early impression, these distressing images of slow, horrible, suffocating deaths. Now, I mention Pike Lake and, for that matter, strange and unnatural death because it was on the trip to and from Pike Lake that we would pass this odd-looking building, set back just off the Miller Trunk Highway, Highway 53, and, by the way, since I keep mentioning it, a brief sidebar, uh, an educational bonus to further enrich the listeners of my Duluthian life. Who exactly was Miller, the guy we named the Trunk Highway after? Well, I did a little digging. Turns out Charles G. Miller was a traveling salesman who made frequent trips to and from the Iron Range plying his wares before there was even a paved road up there. Having grown weary of all the flat tires and banged up suspension, Miller embarked on a solution. He decided to apply his formidable sales acumen to the world of politics, and before long, ascended to the post of St. Louis County Commissioner, now wielding the power of not-so-high public office, in 1922, Miller realized an auspicious goal. Under the proud gaze of numerous dignitaries and with great fanfare, a ribbon was cut, and the trunk highway that would take Miller's name was christened. None other than the Duluth News Tribune called the road, quote, Northeastern Minnesota's Appian Way. And yeah, yeah, suddenly exotic places like uh, Eveleth and uh, Mountain Iron uh, and Bewabic. Well, Bewabic is a little off the highway, but <laughs> I like saying Bewabic. Suddenly, these faraway places were virtually on Duluth's doorstep. So there. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Where was I? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's this massive windowless concrete cube, okay? It's about four stories high, uh, surrounded uh, just by some tall fencing and brush and trees, set back right off the Miller trunk. You couldn't possibly drive by this place and not notice it. As a kid, you couldn't be a passenger in a car driving past it and not ask, what is that? And being a kid, I'm sure I asked that question innumerable times. And as a kid, the answer was really never very satisfying. That's the sage building, my mother would patiently repeat for the umpteenth time. What's a sage building? I would so repetitiously and annoyingly inquire, but all I could get was that it had something to do with the air base. 
Well, I did have at least a fuzzy picture in my mind of what the air base must be about, because at the time, Duluth was an outpost of America's Air Defense Command, and units of the active duty uh, U.S. Air Force and the Air National Guard uh, had set up something called the DUADS, the Duluth Air Defense Sector. It was right there on the same grounds as our sleepy little Duluth Airport in the 1950s. Now, on the grounds of this sleepy little airport, the Air Force had also built a 10,000-foot runway. That's a pretty long runway, you know, like for a DC-3. It's <laughs> actually, it's plenty long enough for, uh, you know, let's say a uh, B-52 bomber. But what made such an indelible impression on my childhood wasn't a bomber. It was the fighter jets. And specifically, the F-102 Delta Dagger, the first operational supersonic fighter interceptor. As soon as they came out, we got a bunch of them in Duluth. And if you lived there any time in the last half of the 1950s, they made their presence very prominently known. Like, let's say you're in your backyard uh, practicing with your new hula hoop, minding your own business. And then, out of nowhere... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what an F-102 sounded like, accelerating past Mach 1 and uh, breaking the sound barrier right over my bedroom. It was really cool uh, when you got a couple of them, you know, in formation. Now, all us kids thought this was just great. Way more exciting than hula hoops. Felt like your eardrums were breaking. Yup, here comes another one. But the fascination and novelty was not long lived among the neighborhood grown-ups. Nobody knows exactly how many of our windows were shattered uh, before word made it up the chain of command and the local flyboys were instructed to wait until they were way out over Lake Superior before they fired up the afterburners. Some of these jets belonged to the U.S. Air Force, which had a base in Duluth. But at the same time, there was also the Minnesota Air National Guard stationed there, the 148th Fighter Wing. So, when we looked up at these supersonic interceptors streaking through the sky, the guy in the cockpit might well have been your barber or your hockey coach. A sobering thought, especially considering that, unknown to most of us at the time, these jets that were flying around Duluth were armed with, yes, nuclear-tipped missiles. The idea was that the enemy, Russia, was going to have to fly a bomber over here in order to drop a nuke. Intercontinental missiles, uh, like we have now, were still in the testing phases. So, the strategy was we'd find out that a bomber, or a whole formation of bombers, was on the way, most likely coming in from the direction of the Arctic. And then it would take just one of these nuclear missiles we had, shot out of one of those jet interceptors, because if it was detonated anywhere even close to any of those planes, blam, no more bombers. What would have become of their atomic payloads? I don't know. <laughs> uh, might have been a mess, but uh, probably not as bad as uh, if they were to be detonated on a target. But still, a lot of radioactive cleanup, I would think. <sighs> As a Cold War kid growing up in Duluth, all this business of the jets coming and going was pretty thrilling stuff. 
It was uh, exciting, but it was also something else. I would not yet have had the word paranoia in my childhood vocabulary, but thinking back, there was plenty of it going around. Every time we heard that sound, we stopped whatever we were doing and thought, is it real this time? Or is that just another test? What day is this? What time is it? Even when we realized it must be Wednesday, it must be one o'clock, we'd been taught not to just ignore that sound. No. Like a Cold War version of a call to prayer, we were advised to meditate for a moment on what we would do if it was real this time. They showed us these movies in school. You may be in your schoolyard playing when the signal comes. That signal means to stop whatever you are doing and get to the nearest safe place fast. Always remember, a flash of an atomic bomb can come at any time, no matter where you may be. They also emphasized we might not even get a warning. If there is a warning, you will hear it before the bomb explodes. But sometimes, and this is very, very important, sometimes the bomb might explode without any warning. Then the first thing we would know about it would be the flash. And that means duck and cover fast, wherever you are. There's no time to look around or wait. Duck and cover. Duck and cover. This was really not great stuff for a school kid to have rattling around in his head, you know? Any minute, blam! And we all knew duck and cover. It was a bunch of BS. There was already all kinds of information floating around with uh, illustrations and plans about how you could build a fallout shelter in your basement. Even as kids, we knew that even if we survived a blast, the whole atmosphere was going to be contaminated for weeks or months with deadly radiation. We knew that, and we knew Duluth had to be a Russian target. You know, the air base, all those jets. We talked about it at recess uh, out on the playground kind of nervously looking up at the sky uh, every once in a while. (sighs) Thinking back, geez, good grief. That, That was a lot of worry for a kid. But now, just to make sure, we couldn't possibly put any of this out of our minds. Right about this time, the government came out with another one of their Cold War acronyms. It was a backup to the civil defense sirens called Connellrad. Does that ring any bells? They probably wouldn't use a name like that today. You know, people might asking, oh, what's so rad about Connellrad? Could have been a line on Beavis and Butthead, you know. He said rad. <laughs> uh, but I, I looked into this and Connellrad stood for Control of Electromagnetic Radiation. Later on, it became uh, the emergency broadcasting system, but what kind of electromagnetic radiation was Connellrad supposed to control? Anyway, turns out they didn't mean radiation from a nuclear bomb. Not at all. Let's say you were just grooving to one of your favorite tunes... And then, without warning, we interrupt our normal program to cooperate in security and civil defense measures as requested by the United States government. This is a Conrad radio alert. Normal broadcasting will now be discontinued for an indefinite period. The weird thing I found out is that Conrad was more than a public warning telling you where to tune your radio for all the dreaded uh, doomsday 
instructions and other fascinating tidbits of terrifying information. No, Conalrad also sent a signal to TV and radio stations nationwide for them to shut down their transmitters. That is the electromagnetic radiation it would control. Should the United States be attacked, warning would go out through Air Force and Civil Defense channels. All radio and TV stations would go off the air. In a matter of minutes, Conrad radio stations would return on the frequencies of 640 or 1240 to broadcast life-saving instructions and information. The idea was that incoming enemy bombers could use civilian broadcast transmitters for navigation to home in on cities. So Conrad would act as kind of a broadcasting blackout curtain. Meanwhile, the Strategic Air Command, with its network of ground-based radar stations and fighter interceptors, would swing into action. And that is where Duluth, Minnesota, would come to the rescue, playing a starring superhero-like life-and-death role. Which brings us to yet another acronym. You remember the SAGE building? up there on the Miller trunk. Well, sage was not just a savory herb to spice up those Sammy's pizzas back in the day. No, sage stood for semi-automatic ground environment. And the sage direction center was one dilly of a piece of defense contracting. Let me tell you. Turns out that huge windowless concrete cube housed what was by far, physically, the largest computer at the time. That's a record. It still holds. It was the ANFSQ-7, built by IBM. They had to keep like 60 employees on site full-time just to keep up with maintenance. Firing up an FSQ-7 took mm, something on the order of three megawatts of electrical power. The FSQ-7 took up a half acre of floor space in the SAGE building. It weighed just about 275 tons. It ran on vacuum tubes, 49,000 of them. Now, if you're old enough, you'll recall having a TV or radio that ran on vacuum tubes. If it stopped working, you'd unplug it, uh, just like mom told you to do first, open it up, pull out all those tubes, and take them to the drugstore, where there would be a machine full of all kinds of odd-shaped sockets you could plug your tubes into and test them to see if they were still good or not. And if not, you could buy a new one or two to take home with you, and voila, uh, you could once again uh, watch uh, Howdy Doody or Captain Q. This computer (laughs) usually had several hundred tube failures per day. Uh, which would have to be replaced by workers scurrying up and down the tube racks with shopping carts full of replacements. But they weren't trying to watch. You bet your life up there in the Sage building. Uh, At least uh, not the one with uh, Groucho Marx anyway. Uh, They were looking at a more real life and death version. In the SAGE Direction Center, they sat in huge mission control rooms with giant map screens of North America. It was totally right out of the James Bond movies. In fact, later on, I think they shot some of those kind of movies in the SAGE building. Uh, They had these uh, fast-processed 35-millimeter projection displays. They monitored the input from a whole array of radars and detection systems. That, that covered the country 
as far south as Texas. And those were in turn connected by phone lines and modems. What they got was uh, an almost real-time image of everything that flew over that whole part of the country. Uh, And then SAGE could transmit that data directly into the cockpits of all those supersonic jets to guide their interception missions. This was in the 1950s, mind you, you know, before Bluetooth or uh, even cell phones. SAGE was also connected to yet another Cold War acronym, BOMARC, which stood for the names of its builders, Boeing and the Michigan Aerospace Research Center. BOMARC was a ground-based missile system, long-range, yes, nuclear missiles, and they were housed in special shelters just a short drive from the Duluth Air Base. Did you know we had nukes in Duluth? I didn't. It was a surface-to-air system that would complement the air-to-air nuclear-tipped missiles uh, in those jets. But there was one major problem. By the time Duluth Sage Direction Center became fully operational in 1959, it was already obsolete, uh, as were those Bomark ground-to-air missiles. The era of the intercontinental ballistic missile, the ICBM, had dawned, and SAGE had no missile detection capabilities whatsoever. And that takes me to some of the darker days of my Duluthian life. It was in the fall, 1962, a U.S. spy plane discovers a, an array of new Russian-built nuclear missile bases in Cuba, 90 miles from the tip of Florida. President Kennedy orders a blockade to prevent Russian ships from coming in with more nuclear arms, and so begins the Cuban Missile Crisis, the first direct military confrontation with the world's other nuclear superpower. For 13 long days in October 1962, the world was biting its fingernails, figuratively and literally. But there on the Duluth hillside at my house, we were doing more than that. Uh, We were a Catholic family. My uncle was a priest, my aunt was a nun, and Catholics believe in the power of something called the rosary. It's a string of beads, each of which we hold as we say a certain prayer prompted by each bead. Catholics believe saying the rosary is a remedy against the most severe of life's trials. It's considered by the Catholic Church to be one of the greatest spiritual weapons available to believers in a battle against evil. And so, in our house, October 1962 ushered in a new family tradition. Every night after dinner, my family went together into the living room and knelt down. We bowed our heads And just as they were doing in countless other Catholic homes and churches across the nation, we held our rosaries and prayed in unison for our country and, yeah, for our lives. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Those nights uh, after I was in bed, I remember lying there, still awake. My dad had given me a rosary that uh, belonged to one of his long-deceased siblings. The idea was that she would probably, having lived a virtuous life, uh, she'd probably be in heaven. So her rosary might have extra influence, I thought. I would hang it on a shelf uh, next to my bed. There were nights I'd be woken up in the middle of the night when those jets flew over. They kept up their exercises and patrols uh, all night sometimes. I told myself it's okay. There's no warning sirens. But then I'd remember. Sometimes the bomb might explode without any warning. Without any warning. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't gather my thoughts enough to say the prayers. I just kept wondering, <laughs> you know, would I go to heaven or hell if it happened tonight? I was scared, really scared. Too, too scared. I was too scared to say the prayers. So I just held that special, extra, powerful rosary in my hands until I fell back to sleep. The whole world was watching the Cuban Missile Crisis and holding its breath, but come to find out, everybody might well have been looking in the wrong direction. On October the 22nd, 1962, at the height of the Missile Crisis, U.S. Armed Forces were put on uh, DEFCON 3, uh, because the crisis was escalating. That's defense condition three, uh, meaning forces were to be ready to deploy in 15 minutes. Both sides of the Cold War were preparing for a nuclear strike that night. And both were very intently watching the other for any hint of an impending surprise attack. Under DEFCON 3, some uh, 160 of those um, supersonic fighters from Duluth and surrounding states, uh, each of them armed with uh, a one and a half kiloton nuclear warhead, uh, they, were, they were dispersed away from large air bases where they'd be vulnerable to attack. They were spread out to smaller fields around the Midwest one of those was the Volk Air National Guard Base in Wisconsin, a facility so small it didn't even have a control tower. As the missile crisis grew more threatening, Volk Field was hastily wired up with a system of signal alarms. Flight operations down at Volk, 300 miles away, were to be commanded from Duluth from the Sage Direction Center. Overhead, B-52 bombers, armed with hydrogen bombs, circled the skies, night and day, so they wouldn't be caught on the ground in an attack. Extra lookouts for saboteurs infiltrating ground stations had been ordered. And then, just as bad luck would have it, Sometime shortly before midnight, on October the 25th, very likely while I was lying in bed clutching that rosary, a sentry on patrol outside the Sage Building, off the Miller trunk, very clearly witnessed a shadowy figure climbing the perimeter security fence. The sentry fired a couple shots into the darkness, 
and then hit an alarm signaling that an enemy agent was actively breaching security. Now, that alarm not only sounded a warning here in Duluth, but also at all the remote airfields under Duluth's control, including, yes, Volk Field in Wisconsin. Back in Duluth, as the clamor of sirens and shouts filled the air, a security detail was sent to engage the intruders. They only spotted one, however, running on four legs off into the woods. Yeah, it was a bear. So, the alert was canceled right away. But down at Volk Field in Wisconsin, in the big hurry-up to install all the bells and sirens when they moved the the interceptor jets down there, uh, a serious blunder had occurred in which they crossed some wires. Uh, As a result, when the alert was sent from Duluth, signaling a possible intruder, it set off the wrong bell. It was the alarm they dreaded the most, because it meant that Soviet bombers had been detected heading toward the United States, and a nuclear attack was imminent. So all those pilots scrambled toward their interceptors, armed with those nuclear-tipped Genie missiles. And they did so with 100% certainty that the Cuban Missile Crisis had exploded and World War III had just begun. Now, even though no Soviet bombers were really coming, what is just as harrowing is that we had all those American B-52s on constant patrol up there, and their exact positions were unknown to the fighter squadrons. What if, in the confusion, they'd launched a genie or two at our own bombers? Nuclear explosions without warning in the night skies over Duluth. What if the Russians had detected those? Then what might they have done? Luckily, we'll never know. As those interceptors taxied for takeoff down at Volk, it occurred to one of the officers to pick up the phone and call Duluth. You know, maybe just to shoot the shit a little bit and make sure we really had a nuclear war going on, you know? And boy, was that guy ever glad he made the call because... Remember, there's not even a control tower at Volk. So this officer had to drop the receiver when he found out that there was no attack, jump in the first jeep he saw running out the door, and drive wildly onto the runway, waving his arms, flashing his lights, and narrowly averting the takeoff for what could have turned out to be World War III. The Cold War military archives are full of incidents like this, where human error came within a heartbeat of threatening human existence. But the most important thing about this story is what didn't happen. Khrushchev blinked and took his missiles out of Cuba. The Soviet Union was eventually disbanded, and there still hasn't been a World War III. But I still got my first big childhood lesson in the futility of worry. It was a good lesson. As for the air base, you know, that uh, 275-ton Sage computer, it was dismantled in 1982. Here's a little trivia. The FSQ-7 computer in the SAGE building could process about 75,000 instructions per second. Now, that smartphone in your pocket, well, that'll do about 3.4 billion instructions per second. Yeah. (laughs) 
It's about 40,000 times faster or so. The year they shut down Sage, the Air Force pulled out too, taking more than 1,300 jobs away from Duluth with them. But the 148th Air Guard is still going strong up there, flying F-16s now. They'll do Mach 2, by the way, and I hope they do it way out over the lake. Okay? (laughs) That big concrete cube that used to be Sage is part of UMD now. It houses their Natural Resources Research Institute. So, in spite of all the angst, tension, and hand-wringing of my childhood years, all these decades later, Duluth lives on, in peace, today, doing, if anything, better than ever. ¶¶ 